Hello and welcome to the Queenslander vodcast or podcast for those taking the audio only option. My name is Lyle Shelton and I'm using this to talk to you about my run for the Senate with the Conservatives. If you'd like to tune in over the next few weeks and months, you can follow my campaign journey as I seek to become the first Conservative Party Senator elected to represent Queensland. I'm a proud Queenslander, born in the Wandai District Hospital, just days before the moon landing. That dates me, I know. By the way, I saw First Man last week, and it's true, the moon landing was filmed in a Hollywood studio. But I digress. I, I grew up in Toowoomba, where I went to school and university, and served on the Toowoomba City Council. I began my career as a rural journalist and worked for Queensland Country Life. I'm not a farmer, but I love the Queensland bush and I love my years as a roving reporter. I covered droughts, record wheat crops, kangaroo plagues, the daylight saving referendum and farming industry politics. I've worked in Melbourne as a journalist with Rural Press and in Canberra as a lobbyist with Australian Christian Lobby. But I've always come home. Like you, I'm deeply concerned about the future of this nation. Queenslanders are suffering under record high electricity prices caused not by global warming, but by politicians' ineptitude. It doesn't have to be this way, and I'll talk a lot more on this vodcast slash podcast about energy policy. But I will say this, we watch our coal being put on boats at Gladstone and Mackay and wonder why it can be burned overseas, but not here in desperately needed new coal-fired power stations. Instead, we get windmill farms which can't power the job creating industry or guarantee that the lights will stay on. It's madness. Freedom of speech is under threat like never before. People like Professor R Peter Ridd uh, of James Cook University in Townsville are sacked because they simply express a different view about climate alarmism. Now I've met Peter Ridd and I'd have to say you'd be hard pressed to find a nicer, more intelligent and thoughtful human being. Brisbane is the home of the QUT students who were punished by the Australian Human Rights Commission simply because they wandered into an Indigenous-only computer lab and then posted some commentary on Facebook. They were later exonerated, but as we see with all of these things, the process is the punishment. Parents are rightly and deeply worried about what their children are being taught about gender at school. Only die-hard rainbow activists believe safe schools is an anti-bullying program. The idea that gender is fluid has captured the universities and the media and is now being taught to your children. As the Queensland Education Minister Grace Grace said last April, parents have to accept gender fluid resources like the gender bred person in schools because we've had a debate quote quote about marriage equality. That was the debate, remember, where we were told there would be no consequences for anyone else. Yeah, right. Climate alarmism, the attacks on freedom of speech, and your children's gender are all driven politically by the Greens party. Both Labor and Liberal, to varying degrees, do the Greens bidding on each of these issues. There just has not been sufficient courage to push back on the Greens because politicians want to be on what they perceive as the right side of history. Meanwhile, not through evidence, but peer pressure and the use of fear of demonization to control, politicians go with the Greens flow. Without holding government, the Greens are the dominant and most uh, influential force in Australian politics, I would argue. That has to change, and it can only change if credible, principled conservatives are elected to join Cory Bernardi in the Senate. Our plan is to form a principled group of true conservatives in the Senate with the courage and the resolve to push back on the Greens, to push back on their stranglehold on public policy in this nation. The upcoming election due in May will be the most critical in a generation. After years of dysfunction in Canberra, it is more critical than ever that the Greens' influence is replaced by common sense conservatives in the Senate. Imagine that conviction back in Canberra. Well, together we can fan the flames of the conservative revolution. This vodcast will give voice to Queenslanders like you who know that there is a better way. Well, welcome back to the Queensland Conservative Podcast. I've always been a skeptic of climate change alarmism. Whenever I see people with a contrary view being summarily demonised, ridiculed, slurred, 
or just ignored when their arguments have not even been engaged, I become deeply suspicious. I've seen it in the social policy debates which I've been involved in over the years, and I see it in the assertions that humans are causing catastrophic global warming, which demands urgent economy-altering action now. It takes far less intellectual effort to demonise someone than to investigate their concerns and have a proper debate. But despite more than 15 years of demonisation of anyone who dares question the orthodoxy of man-made, imminent, catastrophic climate change, inconvenient truths continue to break out, putting rocks in the shoes of many of us. The latest appears in the Australian newspaper this week. Now, cue eye roll from people who complain the Murdoch press would say that. Well, again, the elites who control public discourse need to stop shooting the messenger and engage with the substance of the argument. I know that's harder than just banishing opponents to an intellectual gulag, but it's only by grappling to find the truth that we are able to make wise public policy decisions. So Michael Aston is a retired professor of geophysics and adjunct senior fellow at Monash University. He writes in The Australian, most Australians do not appreciate the level of doubt about IPCC science in the science community. Did you catch that? He said, most Australians do not appreciate the level of doubt about IPCC science in the science community. Now, there's a reason for that doubt. Our mainstream media has conditioned us to believe that the science is settled and anyone who doubts global warming alarmism is a nut job. By the way, IPCC stands for Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It is the United Nations body that is driving the global response through the Paris Agreement to cut emissions and redistribute billions of dollars from first world countries like Australia to developing countries to help save them from climate disaster. So Aston goes on to say in The Australian, we agree the global climate has warmed in the past century and CO2 is contributing to it. What is in doubt is the relative contribution of natural variations and, and anthropogenic CO2, end quote. He goes on to say, the American Meteorological Society in 2014 addressed these questions with a considered questionnaire to members. It found 52% of the 1,821 respondents believed global warming to be mostly human in origin. He goes on to say, the views of the rest range from natural causes being an equal or dominant contributor, while others thought there was insufficient evidence for a conclusion, end quote. Now, if you're like me, I want to know why the media never tell us about studies like this. Aston provides a hint as to why. He says, It is a tragedy of modern science politics that the views of many minority uh, sorry, the views of that minority are not accepted as valid concerns by the nation's scientific leadership. Against that acceptance is funding and the politics that goes with it. And how that affects peak scientific societies, academies and advisory bodies, end quote. In other words, Aston is saying that fear of losing government money means that politicians and the public are not always being given all the facts. Aston goes on to cite the work of Nicola Scafetta of the University of Naples in Italy. Now he has studied natural cycles of climate change in multiple peer-reviewed papers, which have been overlooked in the IPCC's work. Scafetta's work forecasts future global warming to be about half that forecast by the IPCC. It is upon these forecasts of the IPCC that rest demands for urgent economy harming action because of the unwavering belief that humans are causing catastrophic climate change. And because of this, Australian public policy debate around electricity has been driven by this apparent need for urgent action. We have had an on again, off again carbon tax. We've had direct action, billions of dollars of your money, has been and is being pumped into unreliable sources of electricity to subsidise them, such as wind and solar. 
This has grossly distorted the electricity market and has sent our power bills through the roof. 10 coal-fired power stations have been closed since 2012 and not replaced because burning coal is deemed as causing dangerous global warming. Meanwhile, the Australian energy market operator has issued a warning that we face shortages in electricity supply over summer as electricity bills for struggling householders and small business continue to go through the roof. Yet the hypocrisy of our politicians is that while they are stopping the burning of coal in Australia, they are allowing our coal to be exported every day and burned overseas where other countries are using this coal to generate cheap and reliable electricity. I recently filmed this coal train heading to the port of Gladstone in central Queensland. We can burn it overseas, but just not here. We can't even use modern, new, high energy, low emissions power stations, the Healy power stations. Coal is currently our biggest export earner. Yet the Coalition Party Room recently endorsed Malcolm Turnbull's National Energy Guarantee, a policy which recommended that no new coal-fired power stations be built in Australia. Now, the new Morrison government has scrapped the NEG and is desperately trying to lower power prices, but at this, at this stage has not indicated whether or not new coal or even nuclear baseload power will be allowed into the system. We're currently in policy limbo, and every day we fail to bite the bullet, Australia's electricity grid becomes more unreliable and prices continue to rise. It's hard to believe that a resource-rich country like Australia has come to this. But that is the price we are paying for having our ladder leaning against the wrong wall on climate policy. That is the price we are paying for demonising those like Aston with a contrary view and then arrogantly refusing to investigate their claims. Well, welcome back again to the Queensland Conservative Podcast. Well, freedom of speech has never been under such pressure. Silly elite thinking, which is seeking to abolish the idea that humans are male and female, is driving much of this pressure on freedom of speech. Like so many of these fads, to question it is to be demonised and shunned by polite society. But happily, if enough of us have the courage to stand up against the anti-free speech bullies, it is possible to push back. A good news story of this relates to my friend, Dr. David Van Gen from my hometown of Toowoomba. Now, David and I have been mates for years and we've worked together on some of the, the big social policy debates in our country. David is definitely a thought leader on so many issues to do with human rights for the unborn, euthanasia, marriage and gender. We both are opposed to attempts by elites to teach children at school that their gender is fluid, that mummy or daddy can't tell you if you are a boy or a girl, only you can know. That is one of the many dangerous ideas emanating from the so-called safe schools program, which continues to exist in various forms in education systems right around our nation. Now, as part of our engagement with this and other debates, David and I use wonderful social media tools like Twitter, a platform that is such a bulwark of civility and informed debate. I'm joking. Uh, Twitter is a platform uh, watched by Big Brother authority figures and tweeting or retweeting the wrong things can land you into trouble, as David Van Gend was to discover. So here's what happened. Back in April this year, I posted on Twitter a selfie. Yes, I, I know that's narcissistic, but it was too good an opportunity to miss. Uh, my friend Dr. Ryan T. Anderson was visiting Brisbane. Uh, he's a scholar at the highly regarded Heritage Foundation think tank in Washington, D.C. Ryan is the author of several books. His latest is How Harry Became Sally, Responding to the Transgender Moment. The book is full of solid evidence debunking the idea that children's gender is fluid. For instance, it quotes well-known medical evidence that 80 to 95% of children who experience discordant gender identity will come to identify with their bodily sex if natural development is allowed to proceed. So that means if you adopt the time-honoured and compassionate watch and wait approach, the overwhelming majority of children will grow up just fine. But of course you won't hear this at a safe school near you, where children suffering gender dysphoria are encouraged along a path of social transitioning, where a boy might be put in a dress 
and then children are prescribed puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and the irreversible surgery on genitals and breasts. I kid you not. We now have an unprecedented epidemic of children presenting to gender clinics in our big cities. So it was a privilege to have dinner with Anderson, one of the world's leading voices pushing back on this madness, and then to post a selfie of me with him on social media. Now, Dr. Van Gend, who is also an admirer of Dr. Anderson, Julie retweeted our selfie. But that wasn't Dr. Van Gend's only Twitter sin. Bear with me as I explain some more of this background. Also in the same month, I took to Twitter again to provide a link to an article on the same subject by leading News Limited columnist Miranda Devine. Devine had devoted a Sunday Telegraph piece to exposing the lie that gender-bending programs like Safe Schools had nothing to do with the campaign to redefine and degender marriage. The Queensland Education Minister Grace Grace had belled the cat on this lie in a Channel 9 television interview where she had said that parents simply had to accept gender-bending teaching in schools because Australians had voted for marriage equality in last year's plebiscite. No, it's not political correctness, Kyle Mad. This is reality. We've just had the biggest debate in this country about marriage equality. Now, this was a significant admission because the Coalition for Marriage uh, campaign, of which I was a part, warned that one of the key consequences of same-sex marriage would be pressure on parents to accept other aspects of the rainbow political movement's agenda, such as children being taught gender is simply a social construct. Devine was right to write about this. I was, of course, keen for my Twitter followers to know. And again, my friend Dr. Van Gend, Julie, retweeted me. However, that was enough for the medical board's policing arm, the Australian Health Practitioners Regulation Authority, to step in. APRA wrote to Dr. Van Gend, ordering him to explain himself. He was ordered to explain in writing, quote, whether your posting on social media, Twitter, promotes the health of the community and advances the health and well-being of individual patients, end quote. He was warned that his behaviour could be considered unprofessional. This is incredibly serious and it's chilling. Dr. Van Gen was forced to take time away from his patients at his busy medical practice to respond in detail to these serious charges. This was back in April. Six months later, he finally received notification from APRA that it was backing down. One has to wonder whether the sunlight of public scrutiny uh, played some sort of a role. Miranda Devine wrote about the saga and Conservative Senator Cory Bernardi succeeded in having a motion supporting Dr Van Gen's right to free speech passed in the Australian Senate. Last week, Dr Van Gen received a letter from the medical board saying that it planned, quote, no further action and he was not guilty of discriminatory conduct. This letter also stated ominously Quote, the board noted with concern that you have referred to yourself as a family doctor and that this can be read in conjunction with your opinions shared on social media. However, consideration of the information available, specifically being copies of retweeted comments from other members of the public, aka me, <laughs> with no personal comments added, the board does not consider a finding can be made that your conduct has fallen below the standard expected of a medical practitioner and presents no public risk, end quote. There was no apology for the inconvenience and the stress of having his professional reputation publicly impugned. People like Dr. Van Gend, who stand up to the anti-free speech bullies, are heroes. It is hard to believe our nation has come to this. Dr. Van Gen was prepared to put his professional reputation on the line to fight for the truth about gender and for the right to express views on the current debate as a health professional. It is through fear and bullying that elites shut down debates, not through engaging with the, the arguments. While Dr. David Van Gen has been vindicated, it took six long months. As Miranda Devine wrote in last week's Sunday Telegraph, it is the process which is the punishment. 
Sadly, many in our society know this, and that is why there is so much silence when it comes to so many important social policy debates. Thank God for the courage of people like Dr. David Van Gend.